Good evening, and welcome to Inside the Avatar Studio. Inside the Avatar Studio brings together innovative leaders from the virtual technology frontier to discuss their perceptions, perspectives, and predictions of what being virtual means in today's society. I am your host, Kevin Feenan, and with me today is Dave Levitson, CEO and founder of Cranial Tap, not Spinal Tap, I remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> Cranial Tap, a full-service virtual world development firm located in Washington, D.C. Dave is a veteran um, of online entertainment and video game. He's a professional with 20 years of experience producing compelling interactive products for companies including Sega, Time Warner, Lockheed Martin, America Online, Intel, General Electric, and others. He is responsible for the launch of nearly 100 consumer products, including video games, voice over IP dashboards, social and community networks, switch circuit phone applications, user interfaces, interface television, and virtual world environments. That is quite a list. Dave is also the author of six worldwide patents in the virtual world space. Dave, I would like to thank you for coming on to Inside the Avatar Studio. Thanks for having me, Kevin. I appreciate it. Glad to be here. That is quite the list <laughs> of companies. I, I keep watching that and I'm sitting there going, oh my goodness, where did I go wrong in life? Let me tell you. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering to start off with if maybe you could provide some context and to describe a little bit about some of the, the patents and products that you've been involved with over you know the last 20 years or so with a lot of these different you know, you know, technologies and companies. Sure. Yep, I'd be glad to. Um, uh, you know, much of my professional experience has centered around uh, simulation, um, video games, and uh, online consumer applications. And um, working with those firms, I helped develop uh, those in various capacities, uh, anywhere from uh, producer to artist, uh, project manager, product manager, uh, and, and that type of thing. And I, I must um, uh, correct you on one thing, if, uh, if I could. I don't have six uh, worldwide awarded patents. I think it's only one that's actually been awarded. Uh, I think it might be worldwide. The others are still patent pending, uh, or uh, uh, so they're not actually awarded that I know of, uh, but I haven't checked. So I just thought I'd uh, clarify that. But, th but they're on the way. Yes, yes, they are. Sort of, they are sort of like having a baby. Yes. <laughs> cool. Well, what, what are where I wanted to? Uh, yeah, patent pending can be a long time, isn't it? One of, yes. one of the things that uh, I want to talk about to to start things off is this whole idea of patents and you know some of the challenges that we have with regards to virtual worlds and, and patents itself. And I mean to start off with, um, you know, in a digital age, ideas about utility and design are. You know, really, they're rapidly disseminating via these social media circles. Okay? But many people don't really think about patents as a method of protecting their intellectual property. You know, for most conversations that we've had, you know, here at Rockcliffe and you know other people that we've we've talked to, most of where the intellectual property discussion goes is towards the principle of copyright. So I'm wondering if you could explain how you see the difference between patents and copyright, and which you feel is really more important. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a that's a very good question, and um, uh, they, I guess, come down to potentially a matter of uh, complexity and vision, I suppose, where copyright, intellectual property, um, as it relates to that, um, is more immediate and sometimes inherent based on the medium and, and how you're, you're creating it, um, and easier to protect. In some ways, and in some ways it's not, uh, going back to uh, copyright, and especially as it relates to media, where patents tend to be a different beast because patents can be a very difficult, lengthy, complex, involved, expensive process um, that often takes a lot of work. Um, of course, when the research is being done um, on a patent, um, all the prior art has to be researched and acknowledged and even mentioned within the filing itself. So it's difficult um, uh, to come up with a unique um, idea or method uh, that is 
patentable, especially, I think, as time goes on, more and more prior art exists. Much of the work I did in the patent space um, uh, occurred um, in between 99 and 2002, and uh, having come out of the 3D you know, simulation and gaming world years prior, um, I um, tend to uh, project what I'm doing today into the future, and that's, that's kind of what led me to do some of those filings. Um, and by the way, those were filed while I was working at um, AOL, or America Online, at the time. And they had teams of people who would evaluate, one, the worthiness, and then two, um, uh, uh, using outside counsel, etc., um, research the worthiness um, in, in pursuing uh, patents. So I had been thinking about extending gaming and avatars and simulation back then um, into what I envisioned becoming more social kind of media. And uh, so I guess to get back to your question, since I've strayed a little bit, is that um, it seems to me that they're almost two different beasts, again, due to um, uh, complexity, costs, uh, legal issues, etc., um, when you get into the area of um, uh, defending your copyright, um, uh, those issues are completely different than they are in patents. Um, a patent is only as good as your means to defend them, which means uh, resources required to take somebody to court to defend your patent. Uh, if you're unable to do so, then essentially the patent is worthless. And um, um, I think that the... Uh, Media content IP issues are are um, wholly different. Um, um, yeah, was that a did I answer your question fully? You think? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you 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 did, and I guess you know some of this this aspect in in terms of you know why why might somebody prefer to submit for a patent rather than a copyright? I mean, there's there's is there assuming you've got that means to defend is there really a um is is there a very strong advantage um to doing one versus the other i mean the um certainly i mean if if patents are going to be more complex if they require a little bit of a greater vision if if they're going to have that upfront cost why you know why would somebody with inside a virtual world sphere where things are changing on a very rapid basis why why would they tend to want to go through that expense uh, i think that you know uh, copyright as they relate to virtual worlds and, and other forms of distributed media um uh you know come down to um ownership of uh, a media type or or um an idea with more immediacy um, um, art or um, design uh, can be copyrighted, and um, I think that uh, it's it's. And I, I, I don't want to degrade the meaning of that because we do that all day long. But you know, it's easier to come up with a unique visual design or a unique um, uh, way of expressing yourself in a virtual world than it is a patent. Uh, because anybody, in theory, can be an artist and design something, put something together. And that is a uh, vertical thing to have to defend in front of DCMA or other organizations where you can say, I designed this building and somebody copied it and is now selling it. So it's a, it's a vertically aligned thing that's easily created um, where a patent requires a lot more forethought, vision, planning, teams of people who can do the research to find out how unique it is. So they're, they're almost two different, you know, they have two different purposes um, in my mind and, and two different methods um, to, to get them done. Hmm. The, the, there's been a lot of cases where the use of patents have sort of been demonized in the public media. You know, where ideas and concepts that people have you know, seem to take for granted seem to be the center of harassment lawsuits. I mean, this this stuff that you're talking about is the ability to defend. Yes. Um, you know, for example, Loadsys has been in the news recently with regards to their little upgrade now button 
that they're they're going after all of Apple's developers to say, oh no no, you can't put an upgrade buy button now on your application. We own the patent to that, and so they've been reinforcing that through legal harassment means. It is there a line between the concept of a new idea and common knowledge for which ideas shouldn't be patented? Yes, and, and this has been a point of contention for a very long time, especially as it relates to methods. Um, uh, the upgrade button, I think, is a good example of that. And, you know, there's cases where complete silliness, you know, is is um, witnessed, I think. And, uh, you know, the upgrade button, in, in my mind, while I'm not familiar with the specific case, sounds silly. Um, it's something so obvious and available to the public in theory that, um, you know, in theory, a judge should say this is silly. Um, however, we have this, you know, legacy um, uh, institution um, of patents that has not really changed much uh, over time, but nonetheless is being abused for the purpose of, you know, revenue streams, etc. And, um I think it stifles um, innovation in some cases, especially relating to methods. Um, and yeah, I mean, my, my personal opinion is that, you know, some things just belong to the public or should. The problem is who decides that? You know, if it's a judge, well, you know, a judge can hear both sides of a, of a story of a case. Uh, but may not have the technical wherewithal or, or experience in um, uh, the case at hand to really make a good decision. Um, so at that point, it comes down to um, how good is your lawyer. So, yeah, I mean, I think the system is um, um, needs change, um, especially in this day and age when uh, we have things that are in the in open source community um, um, and, and we see that growing and growing, and that's for the benefit of the public, and that's a good thing. Open source has benefited uh, the public and continues to in many ways. And in that same vein, it seems that some of these um, uh, silly things that do get um, patented um, maybe shouldn't be. Um, things that are available to the public freely seem to benefit the public. Um, uh, for the better. Well, that, um, that that was actually one of the one of the questions that I did actually want to talk to you about. Because I mean, having gone through the patent, like I haven't gone through the patent process, but I know you've obviously gone through this with with a number of the, you know, your your own patents and then different companies that you've worked for, and you know, we have this thing that you know this this concept of common knowledge is that we're we're not allowed to. Um, I guess the the law differentiates between utility design and then horticulture, you know, plant, you know, plant design, plant patents, and that type of stuff. But on the utility side of things, there's this concept of common knowledge, which you can't patent something which is deemed to be quote unquote, you know, common knowledge. But yet we see examples of this. All that I mean, the upgrade by not by now button. Microsoft is suing Barnes and Nobles right now for, and this is the gray line, and I'm sort of hoping maybe that you could talk a little bit about this. You know, Microsoft is suing Barnes and Noble over patent infringement for things such as um, child window controls, right, with inside Barnes and Noble's you know ebook reader and their their Android application, remote retrieval and display of electronic documents with incorporated images. I right. mean, this sounds really yeah. silly. Yep. Loading status and you know statuses in a browser, having limited display area, and then editing of electronic documents. I mean, at the time, it sounds really really stupid, really really silly now, but back in the 1980s. At the time that they filed these patents, this 